Hello and welcome in to the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports, and I am joined today by Kevin Flaherty. And to start off, we'll be doing this type of podcast every Sunday during the football season to recap the games, talk about Kansas football, the Big 12 as a whole as well. So really excited to do this with Kevin. And this week we'll specifically focus on kind of fall camp and week one, which is coming up ahead. And Kevin, football is on this weekend. How much does it feel like football season to you right now? Well, I, I got to tell you, you know, I watched a few games yesterday, but I, I think it really sunk in the the late night game with uh, Vanderbilt and Hawaii, you know, watching that on CBS Sports Network and, and hearing that the CBS jingle come on that oh. we all, we're always used to hearing for SEC games or whatever when it's Tennessee, Alabama or, you know, Auburn, Georgia or whoever it is. And so hearing that, you know, Yes, I watched uh, Nebraska Northwestern and, and yes, some of the other stuff. But I think that was really when, when you hear that, it's kind of like hearing the uh, the CBS Sports NCAA tournament song in college basketball where you're like, oh, it, it's on. It, it's happening now. And so I think that was what uh, what kind of tripped it for me. What about you? Yeah, it was like that for me, except the reverse. I'm not a <laughs> night owl. I go to bed early. And so for me, it was waking up this morning at like, you know, 630 and seeing all the tweets about the game and being like, oh. Sure. They were playing football in Hawaii way past <laughs> the time I go to bed usually. But obviously, KU opens the season this week with the game against Tennessee Tech on Friday. Obviously, a different schedule for KU this week. Lance Leipold will have his press conference on Monday. Those will typically be on Tuesday uh, going through the rest of the season. But, Kevin, let's start here. Um, fall camp wrapped up uh, a little over a week ago. KU kind of went into regular season mode with school starting. But – You've always paid attention to a lot of the coverage we've done. You've talked to your own sources and, and things like that. So uh, let's start here for you. What was your, your biggest takeaway from KU's preseason camp? Yeah, I think it's there are, are two things that really stood out to me. One is they really seem to hit a home run in the transfer portal, which I think we felt like when they went through the portal and you, you saw the caliber of guys coming in and you, you saw them in the spring and you felt like, okay, a lot of these guys – our improvements are going to play major roles, but just out of those transfers, the sheer number of those guys, even guys that we didn't even think like Dominic Pooney, you mm -hmm. know, we kind of felt like, Hey, that's, that's a guy he's coming in for depth. He's probably not going to play a, a major role or whatever, putting himself really into the rotation. I, I think that that was a big part of it. The other thing was just increased depth throughout mm -hmm. the program, right? Like I think, we all knew the running back group would be good, but I think we all felt like, okay, Devin Neal is great. You know, Kai Thomas ran for 800 some yards, but you had Daniel Hyshaw, who is maybe the best running back out of that entire group over the course of the entire camp. You had Kai Thomas really, you know, kind of step it up the last few weeks or, or whatever else. And it's like that in a lot of positions, I feel like positions where maybe we felt like, okay, Yes, there's better depth in the past, but there's still a clear cut, you know, group of guys or whatever. All of a sudden, that was maybe a little less clear cut with with some of the depth guys standing up. And you know, I know you've you've talked about this quite a bit, but uh, a, another example is defensive end. You have Malcolm Lee, who's a returning starter. You know what he brings in the Big Twelve, and and he's being pushed by a guy like Jeremy Robinson. And I, I think you when you look across the roster that was something that really jumped out to me yeah i totally agree i think depth is a huge piece and i mean you didn't even mention the linebackers really too oh, much yeah. there and that's the thing like you look up and down the roster and there's i wrote about this on, on the website but competitive depth is a really big theme for me where the depth chart in week one is not going to be the depth chart in week four five six and sure. even week six compared to week 12 now injuries are going to play a factor in that but there's so many competitions going on at so many different positions heading into the season that I think a lot of this will be week in and week out. Who's the guy that showed up and practiced really hard on Tuesday, Wednesday, when they have those really big practice days? Who are the guys that are really putting in the extra work and showing that improvement over the course of the season? Because that's what we saw last year, right? Yeah. This program, this team improved week in and week out over the course of the season. And so I think so much of this year is going to be about the depth and building that depth over the course of the season, where right now you feel pretty good about several positions, 
Um, but can you feel really good about the corners at the end of the season? Can you feel really good about the offensive line depth at the end of the season? I think those are some of the questions now you kind of head into the season with where you, you know you have the depth, but it's kind of a question of how much can the groups collectively improve over the course of the season. I think for me, the biggest takeaway was can you really not sacrificing um, the culture of competition that Lance Leipold has really worked sure. to kind of instill. And for me, you think back to past KU seasons and you could kind of have a feeling of this transfer is coming in. They're going to be the starter. This running back is coming in. They're going to be the starter where this year they've really allowed guys to compete and it's not been transfers coming in and having starting jobs handed to them. I think that's super fascinating because the way that KU recruited these transfers, they were upfront. Like, hey, you are coming in to compete. We're not guaranteeing you a starting spot. We're not guaranteeing you snaps or carries or touches. You're going to have to come in and earn it. But if you come here, you're going to have the chance. And I think that that's something that a lot of these transfers really, really liked and drew them to Kansas was the transparency of, hey, if you believe in yourself, come here and show it, right? And I think that for someone like Marvin Grant or even Sevion Morrison, guys that came from really good programs that – or maybe not so much for Nebraska now in hindsight, but um, you know, programs that are traditionally you think of as being quality in, in the big 10 and even in other conferences as well. So I think that for me was fascinating. And of course, then it kind of puts together the, the feel around the program where the culture is probably the best spot it's been in, in a long time, way better than was ever under less miles. And I'd argue probably under David Beatty as well. I think you have to go back a long time for a program to be on the same page like this top to bottom, all the players really on the same page and pulling in the same direction. And I think that's just huge going into the season. So yeah, I, that's a, that's a great point. I was yeah. just going to say, I think we saw some of that last year, right? Like when all the Buffalo guys kind of came over and, and people were like, well, you know, these guys are coming for Buffalo. They know the system, you know, they're, they're kind of handpicked from Buffalo, however you want to put it. They started at the bottom of the depth chart. You know, they weren't handed anything coming in. And I think, you know, a lot of times there can be almost this. And I thought you asked a really good question about it. A lot of times there can be sort of this when a new coach comes in, hey, I'm not his guy, right? Like he's going to recruit over me. He's going to bring in guys that fit what they want to do. I was a previous staff's guy. And, and I think that. You know, the way that, that you meant that, and I don't want to speak for you or anything, just sort of was more the perception of the players that, hey, mm -hmm. maybe somebody has been brought in to take my spot or, or whatever else. And, and and I thought it was a really good question about how they would respond to that, because some guys have responded extremely positively to that challenge where they've said, you know what, you know, it's great. You came in. We're going to be a better football team you know, because you're here, but you're not taking my spot. And so uh, I think when you when you add all of that together with the way that, that they treated the Buffalo transfers last year, where they did have to work their way up the depth chart in, in order to get snaps and everything, I think that was sort of the foundation of that culture, and they've continued to build off of that. 100%. And I think that, you know, you want to use that defensive end spot that you mentioned earlier with Jeremy Robinson and Malcolm Lee it's not a bad thing that Jeremy Robinson is pushing Malcolm Lee because sure. you've got a player there that can play a junior, a senior, and then as a super senior. So you've got three more years left of Jeremy Robinson. And to think that he's pushing a someone like Malcolm Lee who's a super senior, I think that's just really healthy growth for the program. And I continue to bring up Iowa State because I feel like Matt Campbell and Lance Leipold are sure. very similar in their you know philosophical way that they view a football program. That's what happened at Iowa State. They had players that were in the program, someone like Greg Eisworth, who's an all time or a all Big 12 safety. Yeah. By the time this last season ended, Greg Eisworth wasn't starting. And so I think there's a part of that where this season you can think about different positions where, hey, Malcolm Lee's starting the season as your starter. But by the end of the season, if Jeremy Robinson is starting, I wouldn't be surprised. And I think that's a good thing for the long term future of the program. So I think the depth is good. And obviously, you have a question of, you know, the depth is there now, but is the talent gap? where's that at in terms of sure. the overall roster? I think that's a question I have going into the year, but for you, Kevin, let's transition to this Friday. I don't know if we'd be there in person. I'll be up in the press box, but for you watching the game on TV, watching it in person, what's the one thing you are most excited to watch this week? Well, the number one thing is you just, Mike, you got to win, right? I mean, that's, that's the big thing with it is, is yes, improvement. You know, they'll say be a little bit better, 
today than you were yesterday and so on and so forth. But this is one of the games that I think you you kind of have circled it and say if Kansas is going to reach what it wants to be, this is a game it needs to win, whether it's 7-3, mm-hmm. to three, whether it's 20-17, to 17, whether it's 55-3. to three, This is – this is something that, that you need to go out and, and get this one done. And I, I think, you know, when you look at Tennessee Tech, this this isn't a team that's as good as South Dakota was last year. You know, South Dakota wound up being a ranked team in FCS, went to the FCS playoffs. Tennessee Tech was 3-8 and eight last year, 1-5 and five in the Ohio Valley Conference. And so it, it's a team where you'd like to come out a, and make a statement, but the first thing you have to do is win. And the other thing that – that I think you really want to look at is the offensive line, right? Because when we looked at the offensive line last year, this was a group that that couldn't block South Dakota. And I I don't think I'm being mean about that. I I think that the tape bears that out. But you fast forward a few weeks, and they arguably got the better of Oklahoma up front and, you know, kept going on and, and improving over the course of the season. So you'd like to see them really pick up where they left off. You'd like to see Kansas with the running back group that they have, be able to kind of establish themselves on the ground, be able to protect Jalen Daniels and, and all of that. So those, that's kind of the one thing that that I'm looking for. Kansas can, if it can win this game, if the offensive line can play well, then I think, you know, you don't necessarily draw season long conclusions based mm-hmm. on game one, but you would feel a lot better going into West Virginia if, if those things happen. So with you sitting up there in the press box, well, what's what's going to be your thing? Like, what what are you looking for? I think dominating the trenches is the first part. I think you hit on it there with the offensive line. I mean, I'll take it with the defensive line too, right? That sure. group was a weakness outside of Kyron yeah. Johnson last year. I think that's a pretty frank assessment of it. And you look at the defensive tackles group, right? They're probably going to rotate six guys there. Defensive end, they're going to go too deep at both of those spots. And then at the offensive line, I'm – Curious to see where Dominic Pooney fits in, right? If is Armaje Reed Adams healthy? Can he play? If he is healthy, is Dominic Pooney starting on the other guard spot? That's something that I'm really interested in. Is how the offensive line shakes out. Can KU dominate in the trenches against a really poor FCS team? Because then you look at the next two weeks. West Virginia has a really good front seven. So does Houston, and I think that's going to be a big test for KU's offensive line. Is can they dominate against a bad team, and then? kind of carry that momentum over against teams that are a lot better. And I think for me also just personally, like getting to watch Craig Young in person for the first time, like, sure. you know, you see him at practice and you see him go through kind of the open practice and the spring showcase, but it's different playing in a game, you know, the bullets are flying, you know, so to speak. And I'm super excited to see someone like him because you hear a lot about his athletic ability, him being one of those guys that has really locked down that starting spot at the Hawk position. Really excited to watch him. Really excited to watch Marvin Grant as well. Um, I think you've heard about him kind of coming on as camp has yeah. progressed and most likely going to start alongside Kenny Logan, you know, if, if everything kind of has gone well over the last 10 days or so. And so I think for me, like getting to see some of those new transfers, especially on the defensive side of the ball, some of those guys you expect to be high impact players. Can they come in and look like they know what they're doing in the first week? Because for someone like Marvin Grant, he's been practicing with the team for, you know, five weeks total. Yeah. And so can he look the part and can he look like he is at home? Because you have winnable games early in the season. And I think you want those guys to hit the ground running the most. So, Kevin, here, let's transition then. On the other side of things, um, any sort of worries you have, not necessarily for Tennessee Tech, but maybe over the first few weeks of the season, any sort of worries that you have for KU? You know, I, I do – I do think, you know, you wonder a little bit about the overall talent level, right? Mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the things that you wonder about is, you know, yes, I I don't think there's any doubt Kansas upgraded in in that category with the guys that they brought in and with the way guys have continued to develop. I mean, that should be noted too. You know, there are a lot of guys who are on the roster this year that were on the roster last year that are just flat better this year i mean they they've continued to develop get bigger get faster they know what they're doing now which i don't think you know when you look at at the way a lot of national people write up kansas i don't know that a lot of people really acknowledge the fact that lance leifold in this group they didn't have a spring with this team so they literally they were putting stuff in, in in fall camp in terms of hey by the way, we have a game in four weeks, and this is what we want to run. And they were still putting some of that in 
during the actual season. And so it made a lot of sense that they improved a lot. And that's an area where Kansas, which has the most returning starters in the Big 12, can improve as well. Is those guys knowing what they're going, knowing what knowing you know what they're running and, and all of those different things. So I do think the talent level is a question. I know um, you, you've talked some to Terrence Samuel, and he said – we don't need a wide receiver one. We basically, we need a guy who can step up and make a play when his number is called, but we don't necessarily need that number one guy. My question, uh, I'm not disagreeing with him necessarily, but my question is on third and eight with this team, where do you go? You know, is it, is, is it a situation where, Hey, two or three guys are getting open. You don't need a number one wide receiver. Or is it the sort of thing where you don't have somebody getting open, and, and so you need to need to make a little magic happen? And so I, I think that that's part of it. The pass rush, I, I think, you know, is something you brought up for something you were watching, and and that's something that I don't know if it's going to be a weakness per se, but it's something that I'm going to be watching in terms of hey, if if this doesn't come along, maybe at the level, could this be one of the weak spots of that defense? How about yeah. you? Yeah, I think pass rush is a good place to start. That was something I got asked, I think, during our, our live Q&A we did on Twitter a few weeks back where, like, who's the, who's the transfer that needs to hit a home run for KU? And it is Lonnie Phelps because yeah. you need him to replace the Kyron Johnson impact and arguably I think you could say make even maybe a little bit of a bigger impact in terms of just drawing attention from defenses because Kyron Johnson was so athletic, just like – cream of the crop in terms of overall, overall athleticism. but He, you don't need he to should have made him. Bruce Feldman's freaks list. Oh, for sure. I, he should I couldn't believe he was left. I mean, you look at the numbers that he put up in his pro day, and it, like, it's absurd. It's oh, absurd. it for sure is. It, he should have. And I, I think you look at Lonnie Phelps, and you need that type of production. But you also need him to take double teams at times yeah. on the boundary side because at the end of the day, KU is bigger in the trenches this year than last year. Um Credit to Matt Gildersley for that and the work that he and his strength and conditioning staff, the nutrition staff, a lot of work has been put into getting these guys up to more average Big 12 weights. That's something that Lance Leibold talked about was collectively as a unit in the trenches, they were undersized overwhelmingly last year. And yeah. I think you look at that this year, they're bigger now. How much does that close the gap? That's something that I'm kind of interested to see, concerned Um how much does the added weight another year in the scheme? How much does that help KU? Because obviously these coaches, they know how to coach and get their players to play at a good level. But at the end of the day, if your players aren't talented enough, there's a certain cap that you hit with that. So I think kind of piggyback off your point, I think those two are really good. I think the trenches is important. I think in general, the cohesiveness of the defense, yeah. because you do have some new players there. Um, you know, like Craig Young and Eric Gilliard and even Lorenzo McCaskill to some degree and Kalen Gervin. Some of these guys got a spring. Some of them like Marvin Grant, Jarrett Paul, they didn't. Camp was their first time. So are these guys on the same page early in the season? Because, again, the winnable games are in the first six weeks of the season. Things get really tough over the back half of the year. So can these guys from the get-go really have a cohesive bond? I, I think for me that is the biggest thing I'll have my eye on. Anything else you want to add before we get into questions here, Kevin? No, I, I thought you really, you know, when you talked about the the body development and getting guys up to average weights, you know, we have a, you and I have a mutual coaching friend who is, you know, not at, at Kansas, but has an interest in Kansas. And, you know, one of the things he said last year was he was like, man, he goes, KU's offensive line looks terrible, like physically, like that, you know, that they do not look good, you know, on the, on the hoof or whatever, but he's like, those kids are blocking their asses off. And when you see those same guys now, you know, Bostic wasn't one of the worst looking guys last year, but Bostic looks different this year than he did last year. Mm -hmm. You know, some of those same guys look different physically than they did last year. Obviously, you brought up Armaj Adams. -Ree. I mean, I'm not sure there are a whole lot of players in college football who have gone through the body transformation that that, that guy has. And he was a guy that I loved out of high school, thought had really intriguing athletic traits for how big he was. And so all of a sudden, you know, Kansas could be putting some guys out there on the field, not just on the offensive line, but – at other positions as well, where you say, now, wait a minute, like that kind of looks like a big 12 guy over there, you know, who, who didn't necessarily last year. 
Yeah. And I think for Armage Reed Adams, like it was so funny. We, we talked to him in person uh, a few weeks ago, maybe. I asked him, you know, hey, man, like, what, what's your wingspan? And he was like, oh, over seven feet. Like, just like it was nothing. And you're like, yeah. okay, hold on a second here. So you dropped basically 100 pounds. Yep. And you're ath- more athletic now than you've ever been. And you've got seven foot wingspan. That's something that, like, you're talking about a quality Big 12 guard now the question is yeah. can you work in the scheme and can you actually sure. play football but physically that's the type of player a lot of big 12 programs would like to have and so that's a player like that i think even dominic Pooney to some degree like you see him in person you're like oh my gosh that is a grown man yes. who has albeit it was an miaa program has been in a college strength program for five years now or four years sure. now however long it's been um and so these guys look the part now and i think that's a huge huge deal going into the season so anything else you have to add before we move on no, no, let's go cool. ahead and do it. All right, so we're going to get some fan questions here that we asked on Twitter. Um, obviously, if you're not following myself, I'm on Twitter at mswain247. And Kevin, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, it is at kflaherty247. I love the similarity there. There you go. All right, so we're going to start with a little bit of a, a delicate subject. Um, Trevor Wilson was has, or has been suspended indefinitely by the Kansas program. As of Friday, this stems after he was um, formally charged with aggravated assault with the use of a deadly weapon. That happened Friday afternoon after a, a court hearing. Tanaka Scott, a wide receiver, uh, was also involved in this initially, but had his charges formally dropped due to a lack of probable cause. So Scott's punishment has not been announced yet by KU. We will talk to Lance Leipold on Monday, and I'm sure. Um, maybe we'll get an update there. To some degree, I wonder if this is also out of Lance Leipold's hands because there is still a student code of conduct that you know players on the football team, any student at KU needs to abide by. Okay, we have that out of the way. Let's assume Trevor Wilson will not play for Kansas this year because his suspension is indefinite. Let's just start there. Um, how big of an impact does this make, Kevin? Yeah, I I think it's fairly big in that you know with his speed, he's somebody that really stretches out. A defense and you look at the way that he was used at buffalo even before last year you know he averaged approximately you know 105 yards a catch <laughs> because you know they were they were running wide zone and wide zone and wide zone and, and and then all of a sudden you know they run play action and and he's behind you and i'm not sure that kansas has a lot of other guys like that in, in the wide receiver room and so it's not necessarily that hey you're losing an all big 12 wide receiver but you are losing somebody who maybe brings an element that's different from the other guys in the room. As far as what it means in the receiver room, I, I would have to think, and I, I would have to think that maybe it accelerates the process with Douglas Emelian a little bit. You know, he's a guy that that both you and I are are really high on, um, and is somebody that I think we felt like you know might not be wide receiver one going into week one. But maybe by week six, you were talking about the way the depth chart could shift mm-hmm. over the course of the season. He, he could be Kansas's best wideout. And so maybe that accelerates that a little bit as far as Wilson. Where do you see that change coming? Maybe a little, few more reps for Stephen McBride as well, potentially. Quentin Skinner. That's what I'm going to yeah, bring up here. Sure. Um, you know, that, this might end up being one of my breakup candidates for offense. But he's someone that obviously was put on scholarship over the offseason – really wanted to follow the Kwame Lasseter path. And he's done that played a ton of special team snaps last year. He said he played the most special team snaps of anybody on the roster. So then you hear about this camp. Jason Bean says he's one of the fastest guys on the team. And we know how fast Jason Bean is. If Quentin Skinner is pushing him in terms of speed, that's a, that's a big deal for KU. Okay. Then you hear about him at the first scrimmage making a really big play and being a guy that beat the defense um, deep a couple of times. That's another kind of thing that I look at. And so for someone like Wilson, who has so much speed, I wonder if someone like Quentin Skinner can come in and maybe offer a little bit of that, you know, break the top off of a defense with his, you know, straight line speed. I think you'll probably see maybe Luke Grimm then slide into the slot, Quentin Skinner play on the outside. Because the thing about Skinner too is six foot four, six foot five, long arms, a little bit on the thinner side, but still have that size to play on the outside. So I think Luke Grimm will, you know, start the season as a starter. Maybe he'll be on the inside now. And I agree that Douglas Amillion um, will probably be on a little bit more of a fast track than maybe he was. And I think you have to give credit to Amillion too, because everyone you talk to, whether it be him, the coaches, they rave about his work ethic. He's someone that's putting in the work, 
spending extra time with Jalen Daniels to get a feeling for him as a quarterback. And so he's one that by mid season, I think will be a, a big fixture in the wide receiver rotation. Um, as for, you know, Tanaka Scott, we'll have to see, you know, it, what, what the decision is with him. And I think that he's one that had a really good camp. So, you know, he's one it, that I think I'd said previously I'd buy stock in. So what's kind of your take there? Well, I, I love that you brought up Quentin Skinner because I was going to bring him up with Tanaka Scott if there's any sort of extended absence there. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like Scott and Skinner's line to playing time, you know, they're relatively similar. You know, you're talking about two bigger guys who can really run. Um, and, and both of them had sort of this path to playing time, I feel like, on the outside where, you know, you could – go out there and say, you know what, we, we could use a little more, you know, turbocharge in us that the ability to, to get yards on offense, 20 or 30 yards at a time, rather than, you know, four or five yards at a time. And, and so I, I do think Quentin Skinner is, is somebody who comes out of this, you know, you hate to say comes out of it in the best situation because it's not, you know, a great deal that's going on in general, but overall, I, I think he may be, the most poised to kind of break into the rotation in a major way, you know, and really get a lot of steps based on, on what happens with Wilson and, and to a lesser extent, Scott, you know, I, I think that Quentin Skinner is a guy that, that you're going to see he and Amelia, you know, or, or maybe the two guys that, that could wind up emerging from all of this. And, and I think, you know, with McBride having a little bit of a, Stephen McBride having a little bit of a similar body type to Trevor Wilson. Maybe there's a little bit of a, mm -hmm. a path there as well. I know the previous staff really liked his play speed. They thought that, you know, he was somebody that, you know, if you threw the stopwatches away and, and just watch guys run around out there on the field, they, they were fairly high on. And so maybe, maybe this gives McBride a little bit of a chance as well. Yep, definitely. And just to reiterate, um, you know, Tanaka Scott has not been formally charged. Nobody was injured in the incident, um, according to the police reports and everything that's come out since. So, you know, maybe there'll be a resolution this week. We'll have to see. But all right, so let's move on. Um, I, I thought this was a really interesting question, and this comes from at CJR16255 on Twitter. Um, they don't have a name on Twitter, so we're just going to roll with that. Um, <laughs> he They ask, uh, I want to be happy four or five times after watching KU football games this season. Will that happen? Ooh, it, I think, you know, there are two different questions here, right? Because if you look at it as how many times will you be happy, I feel like KU fans were, were somewhat happy after some of the close losses last year. Mm -hmm. Not like happy, happy, but, you know, hey, we're you're, you're headed in the right direction. You know, they're against Oklahoma. You have the miraculous Caleb Williams play where if he doesn't steal the ball from his own running back – Okay, you might beat Oklahoma. Like I, I and that's not a that's not a huge stretch. And so I feel like you're somewhat happy with that result, even though it's a loss. Now, if we take this to say, like, how many times is KU gonna win this year? Could it be four or five times? You and I have circled one game, I feel like both of us, uh, as sort of the answer to this question. And it's the West Virginia game because Tennessee Tech. Kansas is going to be favored. Duke, Kansas is probably going to be favored in that game as well. West Virginia, you get in week two. Again, Kansas returns the most starters of any Big 12 team. Kansas brought in a lot of experienced transfers. Yes, they're trying to feel their way around, but they're guys who have been on major college football fields before. Um, West Virginia plays Pitt in week one, the a rivalry game. You're coming out of that. Kansas is coming to Morgantown. Kansas, with it playing Tennessee Tech, can maybe hold you know a couple cards up its sleeve if it wants to. That's a little bit of a trap game, I feel like, for, for West Virginia. And if Kansas finds a way to, to not just make that game close, and don't forget, you know, last year's game was separated by a score, even though KU had, you know, pretty much no running backs healthy <laughs> that were that were left, you know. If you wind up winning that game in Morgantown and then beat Duke a couple weeks later where you're exiting September at 3-1, and one, I don't think it's a stretch to say I would expect Kansas to win another Big 12 game, maybe even two if the ball bounces right, you know, if you come out of that 3-1. and one. Now, if you go 2-2, two and two, which is what most people expect, 
then I think, you know, you're kind of setting yourself up for that, that three and nine type season. But I do think you win that game against West Virginia, all of a sudden there's a lot that's on the table because the momentum you built to that point and the confidence you built and, and all of those things that go with it would be just sky high coming out of the season's first month. What do you think? Yeah, I think it all depends on how you want to look at it because Katie's not won multiple conference games in a decade. Sure. So you want to win four games, you're really looking at winning multiple conference games because yeah. I think – it's fair to expect Cage not going to beat Houston on the road in Houston in mid afternoon. It's just, I just don't think that's going to happen. But if you want to look for wins, I still think two and a half. You know, two and a half. I think is a really fair over under because I, I think three in the end is what it'll be. But if you want to go off of positive momentum, can you play in close games and be in, in the fourth quarter where you're really leaning into the TV like, oh, we got it. You know, from a fan's perspective, like, oh, we got to do it this drive. Like, this is the time. If you have those moments, whether it be against Kansas State, Texas Tech, Oklahoma, Iowa State, TCU, name your team. I think that's going to be a measure of success this season. I think I've said it before, competitive games. Can KU play in as many competitive games as possible? Because for how long has it been that outside of really the 2019 season when the team was so hot and cold, it's just not been that many competitive games where KU fans can watch into the second half and really have an interest and think, oh, you know, KU could win this game. So I think that if those are the type of things that make you happy, seeing your team be competitive and seeing the, the players on the field give it their all and be in the mix and maybe the ball doesn't bounce their way, maybe a, a call like the Caleb Williams call doesn't go your way, then I think you're going to be happy five or six times, if not more this season. Um, if you're looking for wins, I still think three. Um, I think if they get four wins this season, that's – that's incredible. That That's great for the year. I, I don't see five. I don't see six. But if they get four, I think the season is a resounding success. If they get three and are competitive and a bunch of other ones, I still think it's a success because so many players on this team are young. You're really not losing a bunch after this year. And so there's a lot of positive momentum that you can carry into this next offseason. You saw what this staff was able to do recruiting the portal after a season like last year. Imagine what they could do with even more of that positive momentum this offseason going into filling some gaps at whether it be left tackle, getting another wide receiver that maybe could be wide receiver one, things like that. So I think that it's got to be a more maybe nuanced answer than, you know, you're going to be happy five times. But it, I think it all is very much dependent on what you describe as happiness or what makes you happy watching college football. Well, it's it's interesting because we had Brandon McAnderson on, obviously, mm -hmm. and I, I thought – it was interesting. He seemed to draw a comparison between 2004 mm -hmm. and this I like year. That. And, and 2000, a lot of people want to draw comparisons to 2003 because in 2002, KU went in Mangino's first year. They go two and 10. They find a quarterback who gets everybody excited. They add a whole bunch of transfers, Juco transfers, but a whole bunch of new faces, and they go bowling. And so there are a lot of people who kind of draw comparisons to that. But there are also a lot of comparisons to 2004 where the schedule got a lot tougher. The team got a lot better, but they actually won two fewer games in the previous year. They mm -hmm. went four and seven, but just about everybody they played that year, you know, knew they had been in an absolute dogfight. And it, it kind of laid the foundation for for what they were going to do in five where they went back to a bowl in six where they went 500 but you know could have gone 10 and two depending on the way the ball bounced and then in 2007 when everything happened and i'm not sitting here saying you know kansas is going back to the orange bowl but what but what i am saying is it could be very similar in that Kansas could fight some teams this mm -hmm. year yeah. and, and really be physical and tough where the other team says, you know what? We're not looking forward to Kansas being on the schedule. It's not that they're good, but they're tough. They play hard and, and we can't take them for granted. And that was kind of that 2004 season. And so I do maybe see some similarities there where maybe this is the year that Kansas takes – sort of that step where it's like, man, they're competitive in a lot of games. And then in in next year, which would be the equivalent of 2005 when they went to the Fort Worth Bowl, maybe next year with all the returning guys, like you brought up, these transfers, most of them are multi-year guys. And, and so 
when you look at it that way, maybe next year leads to the bowl berth, but you kind of want to have that foundation this year that, that really sets you up for success next year. Yep. I definitely agree. Like, can you be a tough out? Can you yeah. make the other team feel like they just played a football game? I think that's like, that's the biggest thing. Um, and so we'll have to see. All right, let's move on. Next question. This one's going to come from uh, Rob Brenton on Twitter. All right. Who's a player on offense and on defense you expect to have a breakout season? And I'm not going to let you start. I'm going to start this time. Of course. Because, you got it. Because gotta we're going to do one on offense and one on defense. So I'm going to start on defense, and I'm actually going to give you two. And maybe I'll take one of yours. We'll see. Uh, because I've written about both these players over the course of camp. And so I think they both have different journeys. Uh, we've talked about Jeremy Robinson. He's one for me. You look at the, at the, <laughs> <laughs> you look at the production last year. Um, you know, played a lot less than Malcolm Lee. I think Jeremy Robinson played the 18th most snaps and Malcolm Lee played the sixth most. And Jeremy Robinson had one more tackle for loss than Malcolm Lee. If you want to look at the pressure rate in terms of pass rush, uh, Jeremy Robinson's was in the high 7% and then Malcolm Lee's was in the low 8%. So not a huge amount of difference there. And I think that someone like Jeremy Robinson, maybe it's not week one, week two, week three, but I think by the time you get to midseason or the end of the season, I would not be shocked if he's someone that is either starting or playing a, a lot of snaps. You know, we talked to Taiwo Onotolu, the defensive ends coach. He talked about them being a 1A and 1B during camp where one day Robinson will have a really good day and then the next day Lee will come back and have a really good day. I think you're going to see that happen throughout the course of the season. And if both those guys can stay healthy, I wouldn't be shocked if Robinson's one of these guys that – you look back at the end of the season and he's played maybe slightly more snaps than Malcolm Lee. Um, so he's one. And then also Caleb Taylor. I think that yeah. for me, you look at his body transformation. I was, I was really excited to write that story. That's one of the ones that I, I really circled and looked forward to writing because I thought it was fascinating. He didn't want to put on the weight this time. Last year he weighed 250 pounds, 255 pounds. He didn't want to put on the weight. He thought he was going to lose the athleticism that he had. And he did. Then he goes out, plays a bunch in the first six games, five games of the season. Then after that loss to Iowa State, he kind of went to the coaches and said, all right, you know what? You guys are right. Like, let, let's get this going. And so he's put on 50 pounds. He's two, 300 pounds now, a little bit over maybe. And I think that you listen to Jim Panagos talk about him, and he went out of his way to highlight him as someone that is flashing. Is he going to start? No, I still think that you're looking at Caleb Sampson and then either Sam Bird or Eddie Wilson starting. But I think Caleb Taylor is going to play a lot this season. They're going to rotate a lot at the defensive tackle position, and so he's going to have his chance to shine. So those are my two on defense. You can now pick your two on defense or one on defense and then go to offense, and then I'll pick up the scraps. Well, I'll, I'll add to your Caleb Taylor and say I, I like the young defensive tackle group. Mm -hmm. You add Tommy Dunn and DJ Withers in with Caleb Taylor. And I think one of the reasons I, I really like that group is – when you watch Lonnie Phelps last year, one of the main reasons he had a lot of success, it wasn't just bending the edge and getting to the quarterback. A lot of it was off of two-man game, you know, twists and stunts and things like that, and him cutting back inside and, you know, making himself lean. And you look at those defensive tackles, and who are the defensive tackles that maybe move the best mm. out of that bunch? You know, Caleb Sampson can move, you know, but it, it feels weird calling him a breakout candidate, even though, you know, Super he could potentially be, yeah, an all Big 12 guy, you know, being a little bit older. But I do think that when you look at those defensive tackles and, and guys who move the best, it's the younger guys. And so when you look at who might pair the best with him, if you throw them out there on third down, you know, Caleb Taylor, you know, twisting and stunting and slanting and all those different things, Tommy Dunn, same thing, you know, DJ Withers, same thing. Uh, I think you could really see that group start to have the kind of season at the end of this year where next year you're looking at that position as a, as a major, major strength. Mm -hmm. And so those, those are my guys on, on defense because I feel like it feels weird to pick a transfer because they've already been there and, and done that. And so, you know, you've got transfers kind of all over, over the place, but, uh, but those are probably my picks with that too, is I, I think that that sort of trio of young defensive tackles if Kansas decides to use its defensive line and use Lonnie Phelps in some of the ways that he's had success with the in the past and be a little bit more creative with that front four, especially on passing downs, 
those are guys that, that could have some moments this year. Yeah, and real quick, just to name those guys, it's Tommy Dunn, DJ Withers, and Caleb Taylor are the three yep. that have kind of garnered the most buzz. Um, and one more I'll throw in there on defense, Tylen Berryhill. He's sure. probably going to start a will linebacker, but it's so hard to pick him, though, because he did play a lot last year, um, but he is one that I think could have a, play much better. But also you got someone like Lorenzo McCaskill really pushing him. So that was a yeah. tough one. That's my honorable mention. But I'll let you pick offense first. We might have the same players. We'll see. Oh, I – Offense, this is probably cheating just based off the offseason buzz, but it, it's hard not to see Daniel Hyshaw having a big season this year. And, and I don't know what that means statistically speaking. I don't know if if Devin Neal hits 1,000 yards and Kai Thomas hits 800, if that means 400 for Daniel Hyshaw. But I, I see him having a major role in this offense. And, you know, you've seen the, the coaches talk about, you know what, our – our running back room may be the best room on our entire team. And, and so you're going to try and and get multiples of those guys out there, you know, at the same time. And, and you look at, at some of those guys and, and the size of those guys. And, and Daniel Hyshaw is somebody with how physical he is, with how thick he is. You could see him playing, you know, in a, in a backfield with, with a smaller back as well. And so yeah. – I do think, you know, High Shaw would probably be my initial pick. I won't pick two. I'll, I'll let you have the next one so that so that we don't cut off on that one. All right. So, yeah, I, I'll go with Quentin Skinner then because yep. I, I think that he's the one that I think is going to be a guy that you look last year, again, played a lot on special teams, but fans don't really pay attention to special teams. Like, let's be honest here. Um, that's something that I think is interesting is who's playing on special teams, but your casual fan probably doesn't care. They're probably going to get another beer from the fridge or – you know, or do, get a hot dog or something during, you know, when they're punting. So I think he's going to be one that at the wide receiver position, KU needs more speed. You have someone like Lawrence Arnold, who is a more of a physical wide receiver. Luke Grimm is a very crisp route runner. Same thing with Douglas Amelian, really good route runner, has some dynamic speed, but I don't know if he's going to be one guy you classify as one of the fastest guys on the team. And so with Trevor Wilson suspended indefinitely with Tanaka Scott's, status for week one at least up in the air i think that you got to pick quentin skinner and i would have picked him anyway as my breakout yeah. candidate even before any of this happened with the other wide receivers i think that he's one that has turned heads during camp he's gotten his opportunity and he's made the most of those opportunities and so really cool story overall obviously coming in as a walk-on and now having the opportunity to make an impact so he'll be my my pick for for offense our homage adams reed obviously oh also. yeah uh, also there for from That's both of one. us, if we were picking a, a third guy, I would bet that that that, that would be it. I, I think he has a he has a chance to be not just a good guard in the Big 12, but potentially an all conference candidate. You know, if he continues to develop, I'm not necessarily saying right now, this year, whatever, but I do think that that ability is there. And this could be a year where we see him, you know. Maybe he takes some lumps, you know, as he's getting used to being out mm -hmm. there a little bit more. But you're going to see him get better and better over the course of the year, I think, and and maybe exit this year as, hey, this is one of the offensive linemen that Kansas is most excited about out of its starting five. Yeah. All right. I just thought of a question. This is not a fan one. This is a Michael Swain question. Um, if you had to pick from the offensive line group, not including Kobe Baines, um, we're not going to talk. We're not going to do that. But from this offensive line room right now. If you had to pick one guy to have the best, longest NFL career, let's call it the Hakeem Adeniji Award, um, who would you pick? Is it Earl Bostic, Mike Nowitzki? Is it Dominic Pooney, Michael Ford, Armaje Reed Adams, Bryce Cabell? Do, like, who are you picking? At or this point, I, I mean, as much as I love um, Adams Reed, I, I think I still need to see it a little bit more there. Mm -hmm. I would probably go with Earl Bostic. Okay. You know, I, I feel like he's somebody – He's he's versatile enough. He's strong enough. He's athletic enough to play multiple offensive line positions in the NFL. I don't know that he's ever going to be a guy that you say, hey, this is a no doubt starter. You know, a, a guy that an NFL team is, is locking down for five years at, at mega money or, or whatever else. But the fact that I, I think his body type and everything, he could play four positions along the offensive line. I think is going to help him find a spot in the NFL. And so I think he's got a chance to have a fairly long NFL career if he continues, you know, to improve and grow at his current rate. 
Yeah, I think he'll need a big senior season for that. But I think yeah. my second choice would be Armage Reed Adams. Yeah. Just because I think you you got the intangibles there. I agree. You need to see more, but that's who I'd pick. All right. Let's uh move down the list here. Um we're gonna kind of hit on this quickly. Uh it's a defensive ends question. Um, this person wanna remain, remain anonymous. Perfectly fine. Uh, how are the defensive ends doing with Taiwo Onotolu? What growth changes and improvements will we see? I'll start off because I wrote about this a little bit on Friday. KU obviously split up the defensive line duties, where last year was Quan Drake working with 20-plus defensive linemen. Yep. This year they split up the duties. Jim Panagos works with the defensive tackles. There's about 10 of them. And Taiwo Onotolu works with the defensive ends. There's about 10 of them there as well with some of the true freshmen like walk-on set to come in still. So, um, that's a big change. That's something that Lance Apple did at Buffalo, and it resulted in, in some positive uh, play on the field. It obviously allows these coaches to coach the players more because it's hard to give in-depth coaching when you got 20-plus guys in the room. When you've got 10, it's a lot easier to keep everyone engaged, get individualized coaching. That's a big thing. Then they're going to play on edges more, which you look at the previous staff, they played a three-man front, more read and react. Like you're standing there holding your block and you're going to see what happens and then you're going to make a play. Now they want their guys exploding off the ball. Like you go to practice, you hear Jim Panago say it every single time. Explode off the ball. That's the number one thing they're looking for. Same thing with Taiwo and Toto with the defensive ends. Explode off the ball. Work on getting your hips inside. So there's certain like schematic things and intricacies that, you know, maybe the casual fan isn't super into, but I think those are the type of things you'll see improvement on. But I guess for you, Kevin, like to build off that, you know, wh what improvement changes growth are you expecting from that group this year? Yeah, I, I think players like playing in that's those kinds of systems too. I, I think that's a big part of it. You know, when you're playing a, as a two gap guy, what it basically means is you're head up on another player, you shoot out, you know, and, and make contact. And then, you are controlling two gaps, one to one to the right side of you, one to the left. And so you have to kind of wait and see where the play goes before you decide which gap you're you're really going to help control. And, and it's it's different. And I think you know, you saw this with Oklahoma. Oklahoma found some immediate success sort of when Alex Grinch came in and they had been a two gap defense up front and they went to one gap and and guys were just loving it. I mean, they were, they were, you know, if you are a one gap guy, you were mm -hmm. typically trying to squeeze between two guys and get up field and, and make a play. And, and I think it probably fits most of what Kansas is, has right now. It, it certainly fits with their recruiting. When you look at Blake Harold and, and guys like that, they are much more like one gap, you know, athletic mm -hmm. type guys. Um, and when you when you look at this group of guys, I, I think there are certain players um, in that defensive end group, basically, especially who are not read and react type of guys. Demarion Alexander was never going to be a a read and react type of guy. He's a guy that's really athletic. He's rangy. You know, you got to let him use his ranginess and as his athleticism. You know, that's that's maybe where he fits. And I get that he was going to be more of an outside linebacker in, in you know, the previous scheme. But a, as a defensive end, you know, that's that's where he fits. Mm -hmm. I do think Kansas has some interesting pieces there in that I think Jeremy Robinson is is a loose guy. And mm -hmm. what I mean by yeah. that is he can change directions quickly. You know, he he's somebody that, that can bend and, and do different things. And so it fits him well. I, I think – Zion DeBose being a little bit more undersized guy, but having the athleticism and the athletic pop that he does, you know, maybe he makes for a good third or, or fourth, you know, whatever defensive end in that rotation that you can bring in and, and let him use that athleticism to get up field and, and really use it. And so I do think that that's maybe the, the improvement that I see is, it's probably a better fit for most of KU's roster to play a one gaff scheme. There are guys that are better, you know, the other way. I, I would say, you know, Keenan Caldwell is probably a two gap player mm -hmm. and possibly a, a really good one. I mean, I, I think that that was why they brought him in was that he had some talent in that area. But when you go one gap with how aggressive you're being with, you know, how much you want guys to, 
to get up field and everything. I, I do think that that's maybe an area where we're going to look at this year's tackles for loss, for instance, from the defensive line group. And we look at last year's tackles for loss from the defensive line group. I think it's going to be night and day. Yep. And I might get cold takes exposed here because the depth chart will come out <laughs> on Monday, but right now it does look like it'll be Jeremy Robinson and Malcolm Lee. Um, starting at the strong side spot. I assume Malcolm Lee will begin the season as a starter at the weak side spot. That's Lonnie Phelps. He will start, but behind him, I look at Zion DeBose. He's someone that Tolu picked out as someone that has really played well. He's played both sides, so he'll be kind of a guy you could see on the strong side or the weak side. And then obviously Hayden Hatcher there at, at the sure. weak end as well. So I think that'll do it for the defensive end talk. Wanted to get to that one real quick because I think the intricacy of it is kind of interesting, especially when you consider what happened with Leipold at Buffalo. But all right, let's go down here to um, a question from Scott Chasen. He <laughs> asks, yeah, what about friend, that? friend of the program? Yeah, friend of the program. That's a good one to say. Uh, all right, so if you had to place a wager, uh, not until Thursday in Kansas, if you live in Kansas, that's when I believe sports gambling becomes legal. So you have to wait till Thursday. Um, if you had to place a wager on one true freshman this year being a major difference maker next year, who are you going with? Before you say that, Real quick, true freshman, Brian Dilworth, a cornerback. James Livingston and Joey Baker are offensive linemen. Mason Ellis and Caleb Purdy are safeties. And then you have Ethan Vasco as a quarterback. From that list, who would you pick? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's probably the easy pick here, I would say. Um, Brian Dilworth, I, mm -hmm. I think, would – would be the one because most of the other guys don't really have lines to playing time, right? Like if, if Ethan Vasco winds up starting this year, nothing against Ethan Vasco, but you've had disaster because yeah. you're Even entering with Jalen Daniels and, and Jason Bean at that yeah. position. And so you've had multiple injuries if he winds up coming in. I, I think the offensive linemen, I really like Joe Baker moving forward. You know, I know Livingston has, has worked with the twos and, and done some good things and, and so, you know, both of those are positive indicators. You'd rather not have a true freshman offensive lineman. And and with you returning four offensive line starters, you know, you don't figure you're going to have to rely on a true freshman unless something goes, uh, goes wrong. I think Mason Ellis is a guy I really like for the future. Caleb Purdy, a guy I really like for the future. Uh, that safety group is so deep, though. And, and, it, and it's a great thing, too, because yeah. – you know, we, we talked about this, uh, I think, a couple shows ago where it's, you know, a few years ago, Caleb Purdy and Mason Ellis probably would have been playing major roles right off the bat because they would have needed to. Mm -hmm. And with the transfers, with the guys that they've added, you know, guys like them, guys like, you know, second year guys like O.J. Burroughs. I know Jason Gilliam's battling the injury, but guys like that, they can come along at, at, and develop at the right pace to where they aren't thrown out there until they're ready. And so I really do think Brian Dilworth is is sort of the easy easy choice to that one because he, he could wind up being your number four cornerback or so to start, and then he could slide into, you know, a little bit bigger role if he plays well. So Yep, I, I agree. Um, especially look next year, right? You're not losing a lot, and – you have someone, you know, I'd like to say James Livingston or, or Joey Baker, but you've got sure. someone like Kobe Baines who they brought yeah. in, who you're, I think you're thinking is going to compete for a starting spot next year. Um, so that takes up maybe a tackle spot. We'll see if he plays guard. That's something I talked about in a previous video on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I think it's Dilworth. Like you just look up and down, right? You don't want Ethan Vasco playing as a redshirt freshman next year. No. Um, Jason Bean still has eligibility left next Bean. year. He can come back. Bean. Yep, Jalen Daniels, you know, still Jay eligibility left. Yeah. yeah, so there's just eligibility left at all these spots. And so I, I do think that Dilworth is the pick. If you had to go with the second one, I might pick someone like Mason Ellis and just purely because special teams, because yeah. he's got the speed and I think he's got the size that a year in the strength program, maybe someone that is contributing in kickoff coverage, punt coverage, just because he has the speed to do it and, and is the tackler. So I think those are the two. All right, last one here. Um in light of Scott Frost at Nebraska, uh, this is going to become a thing, and <laughs> it will. I'm, it will. I'm not looking forward to it. But uh, D Wright 2021 on Twitter asks, "Could you see Nebraska trying to hire away Lance Leipold if or when Scott Frost is fired?" 
I'll let you take that first. Uh, I, I would say no. Um, and, and the reason why is you look at, at where Scott Frost came from. I mean, obviously, I'm not saying like as a Nebraska quarterback, I'm saying his coaching resume, right? Like he had UCF undefeated and, you know, claiming a national title, whatever you want to say about that, you know, finishing a year undefeated. And, and I think that while discerning college football fans and, and people who really watch Kansas could look at this year, if Lance Leipold won four or five games and they'd say, oh my gosh, that's a massive improvement, you know, et cetera. I'm not sure that you could convince the rank and file Nebraska fans that, hey, this guy who won seven games over two years at Kansas is the guy to win at Nebraska. And, and I don't mm -hmm. know that that's the right way to look at it. I think Lance Leipold could could have success at, at Nebraska. But I think that when you're looking at it from a Nebraska point of view and saying, okay, what are they going to do? I think they're going to try and generate a significant – amount of buzz and, and i'm not sure that leipold checks those boxes for nebraska the way that they would want to do it i think i'm not saying he would go because i'm not sure that he doesn't have a better job now but you covered iowa state i i think that matt campbell would be somebody that they would call really early on and, and again i'm not saying matt campbell would take it matt campbell's been linked to all manner of huge jobs that, that have come out. But I'm just saying, I think that's more where Nebraska's mind is at, right? Is somebody that they can point to and say, this guy took Iowa State to a Big 12 title game. This guy had these really big accomplishments that, that are obvious to everyone. Yeah. And I'm not sure winning at Buffalo, winning all those national titles at Wisconsin Whitewater, even with the Nebraska ties, that Lance Leipold has. I, I'm not sure it's enough for that fan base to where it would be the home run at the press conference that they would sort of be looking for after Scott Frost. No. And would you hire Lance Leipold in a vacuum? Maybe. Yeah. But we don't live in a vacuum. You live with delusional donors who want <laughs> a big name. Like, let's be real here. That's how this works. A lot of this is money. And I don't think you're going to see Nebraska after Scott Frost shelling out money to go and get the Kansas coach. Just name value. Like that's not even talking about what Lance Leipold has done at Kansas or Buffalo or Wisconsin Whitewater. That is just a pure, you're going to hire the Kansas coach. I don't think that flies. And so you look at the Nebraska job, like they're, I don't know, like it's just I, such a bad, it just seems like such a bad culture from the outside. Like you see what Scott Frost had to say about his offensive coordinator. Like, it just top to bottom, it just does not seem like a good culture. It, really interested to see who they hire because obviously I don't think Scott Frost will be around, but I just don't see it being Lance Leipold because equally I don't think the donors will go for it, and I just don't see that being feasible regardless of the, the Nebraska ties that Lance Leipold and met several members of his staff have, right? Terrence Samuel yeah. worked with them at Nebraska-Omaha. A lot of these coaches have worked with Leipold at Nebraska-Omaha um, or even at Nebraska in the past, so I just don't see it happening. I think it would be more likely, honestly, for Nebraska to give Chris Kleiman a call if K-State has the sort of year that – and I'm not saying that they would go that direction. I'm just saying I think it would be more likely for them to tap a 9-3, and three, say, Chris Kleiman at Kansas State as opposed to a 5-7 and seven Lance Leipold, even if Kansas does find that level of success this year. And I'll be honest with you. If Kansas goes six and six and goes to a bowl game, I'm still not sure that that's enough for certain Nebraska fans. And, and that's crazy to me because those of us who have been around the program, you know, for a while, yourself included, you know, myself, we would see what a huge improvement that is to go six and six and go to a bowl game at Kansas after the last decade plus. That is, and this isn't stretching it it's the worst decade of football in Kansas football history. People don't realize this anymore. Kansas, when Mark Mangino left, was an above 500 program for its history. And now you look at where it's been over the last, you know, 10 or 12 years, obviously a significantly different place. And, and so while all of us would be like, my gosh, Lance Leifold should be national coach of the year. He should well, be a statue. Things. Exactly. I'm not sure that 
even then that would be enough for certain people at Nebraska to be like, oh, let's go get the six and six Kansas coach. Because nope. Nebraska doesn't want to go six and six. They they want a coach who's going to come in and, and lead them to a national title is realistic or unrealistic as that is. And, uh-uh. and so they're going to want to have a coach that has displayed the ability to to put his program in, in that sort of spot where they're going to be a top 10, top 15 team. Yep. All right. We'll wrap up here. Um, prediction this week, Friday night. The spread's not out yet from what I've seen, but what would, what would be your final score prediction for Friday? Oh, gosh. I haven't, you know – I'm putting on the I, I usually I usually like to uh, to look at stuff a, a little bit more. I do think the Kansas offense is going to show up. I think the offensive line is going to fare well. Um, uh, I'll say something like forty-five to seventeen. I, I think okay. that uh, I do think the defense may have some growing pains. I thought you really hit the nail on the head. Defense is so much about cohesion and trust, mm-hmm. and a lot of times when things aren't going well, players tend to try and make the plays themselves rather than doing their job and trusting that the guy next to you is also doing his job. And and it may just take a little while for all of that cohesion to form. And and so I do think, you know, it's possible that they do give up 17, 20 points or whatever, but I do think that the offense is going to get them over 40 points. And I do think that they win fairly comfortably. Yeah, I agree on fairly comfortably. Um, I kind of gone back and forth a little bit on my prediction. I'm curious to see if KU is able to get off the field on third down if mm-hmm. Tennessee Tech is ever able to get into field goal range because I could see this being a one of those where like Tennessee Tech gets like three field goals and like a touchdown where it's like 38 to 16 in the end or something like that with a, kind of a random score. I mean, KU, the rest of the season, you know, the next 11 games after this game, they're going to want to play slow. And so I, I'm just curious to see if they play slow this game and how much of an impact that has. But. Yeah, I, I think that that's that's another interesting thing too. Is if Kansas lines up, you know, and, and runs, you know, wide zone a, a ton of times, and, and runs runs the ball a, a whole bunch, and, and you know they they control the tempo, but maybe don't have as many possessions in this game. That is something that could keep the score down a little bit. Yeah, so we'll have to see. But exciting nonetheless. Football season is back. Really excited to have these podcasts for you all on Sunday. We might dabble doing them live. We'll see. Um, well, yeah, we'll see. We'll have some fun with this, though. I'm really looking forward to it, Kevin. And thanks again for coming on, as always. All right. Thanks a lot for having me, as uh, as always, Mike. Awesome. Well, thank you all for listening. If you're listening on podcast version, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes. Um, that always goes a long way. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button. And if you're not, if you're watching on YouTube, and you're not listening to the podcast, make sure you listen to the podcast as well. Give it a rating and review. And if you're listening on the podcast, head over to the YouTube channel, The Fog, Kansas Basketball and Football Coverage, and give it a subscription. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again this week.